trying out my brand new joke book. Vicky said, along with others, that I need to get another joke book. I got another one. Y'all have me burn that one. So I'm gonna try my latest, my latest joke book. After careful consideration and endless debate, the perfect man has already been named. I guarantee it's not one of us. All right? Remember that. After careful consideration and endless debate, the perfect man has finally been named. It is, drum roll please, Mr. Potato Head. He's tan. He's cute. He knows the importance of accessorizing. If he looks at another girl, you can rearrange his face. <laughs> she thought it was cute. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll do that screen at the end. Maybe I'll have to get, find somebody else I can shoot it to. <laughs> it ain't got so good all the time anyway, though. Get your Bibles out. Stand for the reading of the Word. I'll put it up here just in case you don't have your word. You can look right up here. God is so good all the time, all the time. God is good. <coughs> I've been having this weather finally goes one way or the other, so my, my, my insides will get used to it. Praise God. We just go to verse 2 Samuel chapter 23. Finishing up today, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tecmonite that sat in the seat chief among the captains. His name was Adino Barton. <laughs> Just check us if y'all were listening. Amen. Of course, now the older I get, the more I say things like that, people don't know who I'm even talking about. Amen. Dean Martin, okay. Adino the Esdite. He led them a spear against 800, whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Dodo, Dodo, Dino. All right. The, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when he was to fight, when, when they were to fight the Philistines there, they were to gather together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. And he arose and spoke to the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave to the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herite, and the Philistines were gathered together in a troop where a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Let's pray. Put your hands this way. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, there's no way we can do anything on our own. No way. We've got to have you. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, to touch and anoint in a very powerful way. I ask you right now, Lord, to help us, God, to see, know, understand your word in a very clear, understandable way that relates to our lives right now. Lord, let your Holy Spirit run up and down in this aisle and move freely amongst us in our hearts and our lives and our spirits. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you for it all. The church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated on the way down. Tell somebody if you're not here after, what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Tell them. <laughs> that, now, I'm excited about Wednesday night. I mean, Tuesday night. Everybody knows what Tuesday night is. And we've got a sign out there. We need to put it on Facebook, too. Uh, uh, live now, live strong. Defeating depression, but it's not just depression, it's whatever you may be trying, whatever's got a hold of you, whether it's past or present. Um, and, and this week coming up is going to be kind of the ground, will be the ground session. And and <clears throat> let me ask you a question. How many here find yourself, whether you even realize it or not, maybe I'm trying to describe it, you'll understand it better, but how many here find yourself living on autopilot? You respond the same way to everything. Certain things come around. I'll be riding down the road and, and I'm in all the power. And, and, and instead, of, instead of even paying attention to what's going on, Linda will go, did you notice that beautiful tree? No, I was watching the road. 
Well, did you notice this? That this over here, no, I was looking over there, and I was thinking about the sermon this morning. And, and, and so, <clears throat> in autopilot. We find ourselves in autopilot all the time. And autopilot, we miss a lot of things. But not only that, when you're in autopilot, also, the thoughts and the negative things that bombard your mind continually hit you, and you automatically respond to stimuli the same way because you're on autopilot. So, so this is going to be good. This is going to help us get off of autopilot. I mean, it looks like I need to be off autopilot. Amen. You know, some people find security in autopilot. There's, we don't need security of autopilot. We need to be able to think and breathe and do our own thing. So Thursday or Tuesday night, we do it right here in this little room. It's going to be good. <clears throat> the base is going to be given on uh, Tuesday night. Doesn't mean that you can't just come in any time and, and get joined in because you come in any time and join in. I'm just saying this. If you want to get down on the grassroots of this, come on in Tuesday night and we're going to be talking about it. It helps you with depression. It helps you with fear of the future, fear of uh, regrets in the past. It helps you with PTSD, CTSD, it's all kinds of things. It even helps you with, if you're uh, addicted to things, it helps. And so if you have chronic, chronic illness, it's good for that too. So, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, we have refreshments back there. We have uh, all kinds of things back there going on. So, so, so you can go back there, eat while you're here. So that'll help you out too. But it's going to be good. Amen? So we're going to talk. Get the grip. Look at somebody say, get a grip. <clears throat> Amen. So this is great grip. Part two. <coughs> Amen. Hey, have you ever felt like you were, you were tired to tackle everything by yourself? In your house, in your family, on your job, you felt like you were just there and you you, you were kind of left holding the back, kind of like on a snipe hunt. How many of you ever been on a snipe hunt? You know what a snipe hunt is? That's where they put you out in the field and they give you a bag and they tell you they're going to run snipes to you and they fly by that house to ground and when it comes, you catch it in the bag and you bring it up here and the one that gets the biggest snipe wins the prize, they put you out in the field and they leave you. Because there ain't nobody there. Ain't no snipes. Ain't nobody pushed them to you. They just leave you out there in that field all by yourself. And after about 30 minutes to an hour, you figure it out. And you come up and find out they're back at home base laughing at you. Okay, well, sometimes I even feel like I want to snipe one. Hey, Amen. I'm sitting there left holding the bag, waiting for the baby for something to come, and it never does. And so, 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 so there comes a time in your life where, where, where you just have to learn just to get a grip. Just get a grip. Hold on. Now that goes. Just a few slides from last week. Just a few. Uh, David's mighty men. This is what's so cool about his mighty men. They refused to join the crowd. They stood. They refused, or they refused to be beat by the odds. They stood alone if necessary. They refused to sit there and do nothing. They, they stood alone if necessary and succeeded. And they saw God's hand. So God gave them the victory. So they stood alone if necessary, but they succeeded. And God gave them the victory. Somebody say amen. Sometimes you, got, sometimes you don't know how you're going to fix it. You don't know how you're going to work it. You don't know how you're going to fight this battle. But you get a grip and you hold on all by yourself. And you watch God come in there and do something special for you. Amen? And so, so here's Eleazar. He comes along. There's a surge of demonic activity in the Philistines. Uh, they were gathered together to bring destruction to the Israelites. They went to do battle. So they were going to actually engage in actual warfare. And, and so the guys all around them got scared, and they ran. They didn't want to have anything to do with this. And so here's Eleazar. He's all by himself. But the cool thing about Eleazar is Eleazar, he stood alone. Just him and David, but he stood alone, and he fought. He didn't let the odds beat him. He didn't let how things look beat him. He fought. But as everybody, there comes a time in everybody's life when you're fighting. I mean, sometimes life is a continual fight. It, there's a battle after battle after battle. If, if you're a dad, you got more than, you got one child, all of a sudden you got that, your battles and their battles, and then you got two or three children, you got your battle and their battle, and all three of those battles going on. You got other people in your family, you try to get them in their battles. So usually, everybody is usually involved in about ten battles at one time. Did you know that? At least ten. Because you've got your battles, your kids' battles, your family's battles, the church battles. So you put them all together. Everybody is usually, y'all say 10. Everybody's in about 10 battles at a 
time. And so as he's in this battle, he starts growing weary. The word the Bible says that he grew weary in this battle, which means literally he got tired to the point of physical, emotional, spiritual exhaustion. He was totally exhausted. Matter of fact, my mom used to say, my mom, daddy, I'm just worn slam out. Amen? Eleazar was worn slam out. But not only did he grow tired, his trust began to grow because he refused to give up. Jeremiah 12 and 5 says, if, if the footman wearies you, what are you going to do when the horseman come? And it says also in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, it says, again, uh, those outer man perish, uh, we faint not because inside we're renewed daily. You don't have to quit. You don't have to give up. So what he found out is each step we take, we invite two things. We invite attacks and we invite power. So, so here we go. Here we go. Here, here's our new stuff. Ready? Y'all say amen. All right, here we go. He refused to quit. He refused to let go. He refused not to fight. How did he accomplish so much? So, he had a grip, but not just a grip in the moment. He had a grip first off, and, and this has got to get here first so you can get where we're going. He had a grip on his past. He came from behind, not to a life of excuses, but to excel. He was with the 400 that came to David. The 400 were in debt. They were distressed. They were discouraged. And, and so here's David. They're in the cave of Abdullah, and, and they're having a bad time, but God took these people, got their focus off of what, how bad things were, and got their focus on the future, got their focus off of their problems, got their focus on the promise that began to look to God. And these guys did some of the most powerful things ever written in Israeli history. These 400 guys who seemed to be, at the time, a bunch of losers, wound up being some of the strongest men in history. So, so he, had a, he had a grip on his past. But not only had a grip on his past, he had a grip on his present. Now, now watch this. The Bible says, if you read a little further, he was in that field of lentils. Now, now lentils, of course, were, 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 were peas. They were beans. And, and these lentils were used to feed the livestock. They were used to feed the people. They were even used part of stuff. They were used to make different things out of the stuff that was left over. And so, so, so this meant a lot to them. To lose these lentils meant a whole lot. And so he stood in the middle of... And he defended these crops. Let me ask you a question. Do you realize, again, the Bible says, I love this. Say not yet, there's four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, lift up your eyes and look to the fields. For they're already white in the harvest. Why do we keep thinking one day we're going to serve God? Why do we think one day we're going to get up and do something for God? Get up and do it now. You never know who's watching you. You never know who's paying attention. When you get your grip on the present, then all around us, you know, again, I, I had no idea when I left Procter & Gamble and last night, my boss man came up to me and, and when I first got saved, he told me I don't want to hear it, don't even shove it down my throat, don't even talk to me about it. I said, okay, I won't. And so I just lived the life before him. He said, I'm a declared atheist, I know I'm an atheist, I do not believe in God, and I don't need you shoving it down my throat. I said, okay, no problem. So I just prayed for him all the time. And that was it. I just prayed for him. For years, I just prayed for him. And that last night, as I was walking out of the plant, he came up to me and he said, I want you to know something. I said, what's that? He said, you know, I told you I was an atheist. I said, yep. He said, I told you not to say anything to me about it. Right? I said, that's right. And he said, you did. You kept your word. I said, that's right. He said, but I am a believer in God now. And I said, wow, that's awesome. I said, what happened? He said, you never said a word with your mouth. He said, but your life spoke so loudly to me that I knew there had to be a God when I saw God operate through your life. So you see, you never know who the harvest is around you. You never know who you're going to touch and who, you're going to, who, who God is going to bring into the kingdom because you refuse to give up. The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of work to be done, but you know what? There's not a whole lot of people knocking down the doors, trying to get the work done. Amen. <clears throat> so let me just tell you where he was at. <clears throat> it was a place called Past Ammon. Past Ammon literally means the boundary of blood. And so he's defending these 
peace, the, the, the defending their livelihood, is defending their lifeline in this place called the boundary of blood. In other words, there's a line in the sand, but this line in the sand is made with blood, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you've got to understand something. Every time you step up to the plate and speak to somebody about Christ, or every time you live Christ in front of people, you're on that boundary of blood, and people are watching. So he had a grip on his presence. Now, now, now get ready. Here we go. This, 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 this is so awesome right here. It said he gripped a sword. Well, you know what? If you look that word up, sword, uh, in the Bible, he had a grip on his weapon. If you look that word up, sword, in the Bible, it actually <coughs> talks about, in the Hebrew, it's that short, two-edged sword that the soldier carries, carries with him on his side. That short, two-edged, little bitty sword usually had a little bit of a, 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 a go up, like I said, had a curve in it. And so what it was for is, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, not only could you come at the guy or come at the guy this way, but you could take when, when no, nothing could penetrate his armor, nothing. Your big sword couldn't penetrate it, nothing could penetrate it. You could take that little sword with that little curve in it, two-edged sword, about that long, about 12 inches long, and you could go up under his breastplate. That's what they would do, go up under the breastplate in hand-to-hand -hand combat, reach inside of him, and twist it. And when you twisted it, I know it's kind of gory, and you're getting ready to have lunch off of this. This is our new egg reduction program. <laughs> when the sword went up in him and you twisted it, what it did was it, it, it destroyed his, his aorta. It would destroy his esophagus. It would get to his heart. If you got up high enough, you could twist. And all it took was one twist, right up and twist. And the really special forces, they were experts in this. So one up under his breastplate, twist it, come back down. The guy hit the ground dead. That's very prominent what these guys did. So it was a sure weapon because it took care of business. Even though it was small, it took care of business. Well, if you look at Ephesians 6 and 17, when it says the sword of the spirit, it's talking about a machete. It's talking about the same thing. It's talking about that little sword that's got that hook in it where you go up underneath and twist and come back down. That's what it's talking about. It's the sword of the spirit. Now watch this. If you think about the sword of the spirit, let, let, let's, let's just dig in kind of thing here. How many of you ever heard of the rainbow word? The rainbow word is when you say, say a lot of people know the word, but it does them no good. Why does knowing the word not do them any good? Because they never apply it to their life or apply it to their situation. It's kind of like I can have a road map to help me get to Georgia to a special place in Georgia, but I'm putting a road map in my trunk or in my glove compartment, never take it out, then I'm in trouble. Or if I have a GPS, but I unplug it and never turn it on, then I might have a hard time getting to Georgia. Even though I had stuff right there, I had the stuff in front of me, directions in front of me, I did not use them. The same way, the Word of God, many of us, we have the Word of God, we've known it since we were young, but we never applied it to our situation. It's when you apply the Word of God to your situation. That's when it becomes powerful. That's when the Word of God speaks to you. Hey, have you ever been somewhere going through something and while you're going through it, out of clear blue, out of nowhere, all of a sudden you start hearing the Word of God speak to you as you're going through that problem? Anybody ever heard of that? You know what that is? That's the rainbow word. That is the Word of God that you know applied to your circumstance. It's the Word of God applied to what you're going through. And so now, you don't just have the Word of God uh, in your head, but now you've got the Word of God in your heart and in your spirit. And so, Raymond, is when God's Word is applied to my situation, I can hold on. You know, uh, again, the Bible tells us uh, in Isaiah uh, 50 and 4, a word in season. It's a word in season to the weary. It's something special. It's powerful. It's hope. It's guidance. If you can't get your hand on anything else, Put your hand, get your grip on the word. Now, how many know what yesterday was? Or was this week we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. And I was watching some tapes they had, had not found. They found these tapes, so they put all these tapes together. And it was the Gemini <clears throat> program, and it was the Apollo program, and it went through 
a lot of missions. There was guys talking and it showed some scenes, some stuff that had not been seen uh, since the day the film was taken. Even some stuff that that, that, that Collins pictures that Collins took and, and Buzz Aldrin took that, that nobody even knew. Uh, 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 we didn't know because we had never seen these, but they were shown on the Science Channel last night. And I was watching this, and, and, and I never knew just how close they came. to. Because remember, the computer in the lunar module, hold up your phone. Hold up your phones. It's okay. Hold on. Do you know that you got more computing power in this than the lunar module had? And so these guys, these guys, it was kind of like they were flying up there with, 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 a, with a cord and two, 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 two cans and a cord. And they're going along, and, and, and all I could think about was this was so awesome. They were saying how they picked who did what in the space program. Well, they were training the astronauts on Earth with a simulator that actually flew in the air and, and they could try to control the lunar module. Well, while they were trying to do this, uh, uh, he, Neil Armstrong was up in the air. The gas gauge was broke. It had to have been a Ford. The gas gauge was broke. <laughs> Look, the, 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 gas, the, gas, the gas gauge was broke, and so in a split second, that big old monstrot, a, a, a big old monstrot, or whatever you want to call the thing, that sort of like simulated the lunar module, it started falling, and they were watching, and all of a sudden, Neil Armstrong ejects out, and it comes out and crashes. And so he, he, he comes out safe, safely, it almost killed him uh, in the train. And so they said right then, for him to think that quick on his feet, uh, they wanted him to be the first one to step on the moon. So, so here he is. I'm talking about getting a grip on your weapon. You get a grip on what's going around you, your present, your weapon. As he's going down, they only had so many seconds. They only had so much gas or fuel because this fuel was rationed because each thing was, was pegged out. They went to land. <coughs> they didn't have all the stuff we've got down. They go down. They didn't, they didn't see a tranquility. They can't, they're just starting to see down there. He said, we can't land here. This is dangerous. We've got to move it. And so him and Buzz, him and, him and Buzz Aldrin, you hear him talking back and forth. Buzz is the man in the controls. He's watching and, and trying to loop, try to drive this thing. And NASA was going, we need to abort. We need to abort. We need to abort. And cool head, every nurse is cool as cucumber. They said, oh, this is it. This is going to be okay. And they had just a matter of a few seconds of fuel left when he landed on the moon. He gets out, and nobody knows what he's going to say. He gets out and says, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. They ask him later where that come from. He said on the way up, he thought about being a child. and playing mother may I. It says, Brother Mac, can I take three leaps to or take, take three steps to you? Uh, or should I take, take three steps to go, Mother May I? He said, or take three giant leaps. And he said, all I can think about was Mother May I while I was on the way. He said, if I was thinking about Mother May I, it made me think about one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But it was amazing to me because he had a grip on his training. They went to a board, he had a grip on his training, he had a grip on his weapon. He had a grip on his surroundings, and he did the impossible. When they wanted him to abort, he did it anyway because he had a grip on what was going on around him. Let me ask you a question. Have you got a grip on what's going on around you? Are you being frustrated by emotions? Are you being frustrated by what people are saying? Are you being frustrated by, by, by just the flesh and Satan playing games with your mind? That's part of what Tuesday night is going to be about. Or are you, do you have a grip, that rainbow word, on what's going on in your situation? Do you trust God in the middle of this all to take care of you? Amen? So now, watch this. I love this about his weapon. Get ready. We're getting ready really to close. And of course, it's your time up, Brandon, with the altar call. <laughs> He's looking at me smiling. There you go. He does such a wonderful job. Amen. That's right. Never, sometimes you never know what you can do. You never know just, just what you got in you until you get squeezed out of you. Amen? That's right. So, his grasp 
was made firmer by the conflict. I, I remember at work, there would be times they would send me over. I remember one night I had, I had not been there in months uh, with the ULF stuff, uh, uh, the, the ULF formers and the POCs for the warehouse. I had not worked in that area for months. And, and uh, I was put back over in that area. And on that night, I go in. They had these brand new PLCs. I go in, and the unit form is not working. It takes place to 10 people. They're really uptight and upset because it's not working. The two guys in the shop I was working with, both of them had gone to two weeks' worth of training for this thing. I come in. It's my first night back. I haven't even been oriented to these PLCs. And they come up to me. A boss man comes up to me and says, David, we need you to fix this. I said, but you and this other guy went to the training. Y'all were the ones that were oriented to this. He said, David, we need you to get it going. We have no idea what we're doing. I said, but you had the training. I haven't. And so he brought me the book. And he said, fix it. I said, well, give me a minute. And so quickly, I picked up the book, and I began to look at it. And I made a quick orientation, a quick orientation. And as I made an orientation, I took the book and I took it out with me to the machine and began to look at the book. And I began to look at the machine and I began to put them back and forth and figure it out. And just a matter of time, it was up running. And I said, see, we knew you could do it. Y'all are the guys with training. But you know what? How many times have you got a problem? And you want somebody else to fix it. And God puts you in a position where you're all there by yourself. And the only thing you can do is get the manual out. And start looking. And trying to figure out how to handle what you got. Last week we ended with this scripture right here. Cast all the way there for your confidence. Which has great recompense and reward. It talks about a soldier in battle getting scared. Getting afraid. Throwing down his weapon. And running away from the enemy. We don't need to be running away from the enemy. We need to run toward the enemy. Children of Ephraim. Being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They were more than enough for their enemies. But they didn't look at what they had. They didn't have a grip on their weapons. And they got afraid and they run. They threw their stuff down and run. I think about this day and time. I see people all the time. They, 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 they get in battle. They've got what they need. They've got everything they need. What happens is they let their emotions get the best of them. They let fear get the best of them. And although they're more than well equipped to take care of business, they throw it down and run. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, that means to stand till you're totally exhausted. Stand without any more power to stand. Having done all to stand, hold your ground. After you've done everything, hold your your ground. So now, I love this part. This is my favorite part of this whole scripture right here. He refused to let go of the grip. And because he refused it, it made his sword cleave to him. Because he refused to let go, he grabbed a hold of it. here. We're going to close after these principles. Whatever we cling to shapes our grasp. I'll let that sit a minute. Whatever we cling to shapes our grasp. What are you clinging to? What are you holding on to? What are you letting shape your life? Whatever you cling to, that's going to shape it. If you cling to fear all the time, then that's going to shape That's going to change it. If you cling to emotions, and that's going, to, that's going to shape you. But if you cling to the word, then your first response out of your mouth. I remember, I remember one time, there was a young lady, I've told this before, there was a young lady in our church, and she had asthma. 
really, really bad. And sometimes it got uncontrollable. And one night she got a bad asthma attack. And her husband just jumped up and said, we're gone. And I said, what's wrong? He said, she's having a bad attack. And I said, well, okay, but let us pray for her first. He said, we don't have time for that. And he ran out. And I just stood in awe. We don't have time for a quick prayer. I didn't want you, you still got a doctor. You got a doctor. Call you 911. Yeah, we, God gives us sense. We don't have time to pray. We got to go. And so I was kind of sitting there and I said, God, did he even realize what he said? And in a matter of seconds, he came back into church and he held his daughter and he said, let's pray. And you know, the asthma attack went away. He had to drive 20 miles to a hospital with her having an asthma attack. I want prayer, don't you? Yeah. So whatever we cling to shapes our grasp. Is your grasp, you got a grasp of fear? You got a grasp of unbelief? You got a grasp of, of emotions? Or do you have a grasp of that word? Because that's what's going to come out when you're squeezed. When we cling to the right thing, it will get us beyond the bad thing. I can think of things right now in my life that you know what? If I could change them, I'd change them. One thing I get through school right now, you're graduating. Da da da. <coughs> when we cling to the right thing, it'll get us beyond the bad things. You know, there comes a time when all you can do is hold that word. Just hold the word. God, I don't understand it. God, I can't figure this out. This is beyond my reasoning. I, it just doesn't make sense. But I'm going to, since I can't hold on to the situation, because the situation keeps changing, I'm going to hold on to this. And I know eventually, eventually, everything's going to fall into place. But i got to hold on to this for my own purpose, or I will go crazy trying to keep up with what's going on. And then finally, the word is the right thing. It has a unique stay in power. It clings back. The Bible says, come on up here, Brandon. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Remember this, whatever you cling to shapes your grasp. When you cling to the right thing, it gets beyond the bad things, and the word is the right thing. That unique stay in power. I have people all the time ask me, <clears throat> that year spending all those times at the, at the cancer center, <coughs> and at both cancer centers, one in Washington and one in Greenville, back and forth in the last seven weeks, I was at one or other just about every day. And, and I remember people saying, well, how, how do you do this? How can you keep smiling? And how can you just keep speaking words to positive words? And you're speaking positive words not, not just to Bethany, but to us. How, how can you keep doing that? It's because I refused to let my situation shape my grasp. I held on to the Word and let the Word shape my grasp. Over the years, there's been some rough things and some, stuff, some rough stuff having to forgive people for and forgive myself for and you go, how can you do that? It's because I learned not to hold on to that stuff but to grasp the word. And the word shaped my grasp. God has something so special for us. Everybody stand. Y'all said the best is yet to come. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you're here right now, you would say, you know what, Pastor, I, I never even thought about it that way. But I've let a lot of things that I shouldn't have let shape my grasp. I didn't have a grasp on me yesterday. 
I'm not sure if I got a grass pole today, and I definitely did not have my grass pole, my weapon. I didn't realize that whatever I do grasp, it shapes. Whatever I hold on to will shape my grasp. If I hold on to hurt and betrayal, that shapes my grasp. I'm never, I never want to talk to anybody else again because I'll be afraid of them. If I hold on to anger, that shakes my grasp. And now, I have a very short fuse. If you hold on to fear, it shapes your grasp. And you walk around full of anxiety. If I hold on to things that happened to me in the past, it shakes my grasp. And now I stay depressed. When you hold on to the word of his promises, it can help you get past all those things. your hands this way. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we know, God, that there's nothing impossible for you, Lord. We know, God, that you have healing in your touch. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch my sister. Temper, feel your power. 
and your anointing. Lord, let her know, God, that you're there with her. And God, you don't need a prescription to take care of this. You got this. You created her. You can take this inflammation out. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it right now. We thank you for the swelling to go down. Right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it going down right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's going down. We thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't forget, Tuesday night, the very first night, you want to be there so we can get a foundation. I'm like, matter of fact, we're going to, because this is, involves a lot of meditation. When I say meditation, I'm not talking about sitting there with your legs crossed going, mm, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literally, you're going to be, you're going to meditate. God told Joshua, to, for his success, meditate on God's word day and night. Meditate. Keep it in front of you. Speak it. And so part of this is going to be that. It may not it make sense right to start with, but you will get it, and once you get it, it will make a change in your life. I promise you, because remember, your mind only can do what it knows. It will not do what it doesn't know. That's why when you get in trouble, you're trying to learn a new way to do things, you get in trouble, you flee back to the familiar. The reason is because the brain wants to use only what it knows. So it goes right back to the familiar. And so the things you don't want to do, you keep doing. Why? Because it goes back to the familiar. So it's going to be a new way of thinking. And so Tuesday night, we're going to try one of those exercises together. You can carry this stuff home with you. I'm going to have worksheets for you. And I'm going to give you several exercises to do this week. And you just practice these exercises. You don't have to go get a little room to do them. You can do them in the checkout line. You can do them sitting at Hardy's. You can do it uh, riding down the road. These are good exercises and, and the meditations that will help you uh, uh, get your, get, get in now, not, remember, in the future, anxiety. And here's what I say, if all you ever talk about is what if, what if, what if, and you stay uptight, then you've got anxiety about the future. If all you can say is shoulda, coulda, woulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda, you're depressed because of the past. But if you can release both of those and stay right now, God can do something with you. Your life will change. Overnight, it'll change. Okay? Y'all y'all happy? You know what? Say amen. Yeah. All right, God's good. All the time. All the time.